Hello, everybody, and welcome to BA and Product Management Days 2021. So today we have another amazing speaker that I'm super excited to introduce you to. So Carl Wiggers is a principal consultant with Process Impact in Portland, Oregon. He provides training and consulting services worldwide on many aspects of software development, management, and process improvement. Prior to starting Process Impact in 1997, Carl spent 18 years at Kodak as research scientist, software developer, software manager, and software process and quality improvement leader. Carl is the author of worldwide popular books on software development and management. In his talk, Requirements Management Best Practices, Carl will summarize several core uh, practices for effectively managing any set of software requirements. So there's also one interesting fact is that uh, Carl also has 50 years of experience playing the guitar. And in the end of the session, we will share with you his personal website where you will be able to check out his uh, recorded covers and his personal books. So stay tuned. It's going to be awesome. So Carl, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Lilia. And hello, everybody. As Lilia pointed out, today I'm going to describe several practices that can help any team do a better job of managing its requirements. Now, and some, some important things to remember, how thorough and formal you want to be when it comes to managing your project's requirements is up to you. There aren't any requirements police that are going to come after you if you decide not to do some of the things that I talk about here. If you're working on a fast-moving, rapidly changing project, uh, that has ordinary level of risk, you might decide to streamline some of these practices or maybe not use them at all. But if you're working on a higher risk project, a project that involves people working in multiple locations, a product that requires certification by some external body, then you should thoughtfully select and adapt the practices I'm going to describe here because I think they'll help you do a better job. Now, the first problem that I always have when I talk about requirements, and I've given hundreds of talks about requirements, the first problem we have is simply one of terminology. Some people call this whole discipline requirements management. Some people just call it requirements. I call it requirements engineering. Maybe that's a little bit optimistic, but it's a pretty well-established term, so we'll use that today. And I find it helpful to split this whole domain of requirements engineering into two major sub-disciplines, requirements development and requirements management. And the goal of requirements development is to figure out and capture and agree upon some set of functional product or functional requirements and product characteristics that will achieve their stated business objectives. And there are four main activities in requirements development. Elicitation is more than just gathering requirements. I don't like to talk about gathering requirements. Elicitation does involve some collection, but it also involves a lot of discovery and a lot of invention of requirements. We need to analyze those requirements to make sure we understand them and represent them in different ways so we can reach the shared understanding that's so important to project success. We need to record that information in some form, and there are a lot of ways that you can choose to specify your requirements, but I should point out that simply hoping everybody remembers them is not a very good approach. And we need to validate those requirements to make sure that they're correct, they're of high quality, and that if we build a system based on those requirements, we'll satisfy our user needs. Now, requirements management begins, oops, sorry, let me go back one. Requirements management begins as soon as you have your first requirement because you might need to start dealing with changes, you might need to keep track of it, you might need to know what its status is at any point. So requirements management is really about what do you do once you have some requirements and then the project continues. So here are the basic practices of requirements management that we're going to talk about today. First of all, creating a requirements baseline, and I've highlighted here in yellow some key words. We need to, to manage versions of requirements documents. Now, note that when I talk about a requirements document, it doesn't have to be a traditional word processing document. You can store requirements in lots of different forms, Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, index cards, databases, commercial requirements management tools. I don't really care how you choose to store them but you still need to apply these same practices to manage those requirements effectively. So if I talk about a document, don't 
Don't worry about exactly what form that is. I'll just use that term for convenience. We do need to put into place and to follow some kind of effective change control process. Part of that process should be to do impact analysis so that when someone suggests a change or requests a change, we do a little bit of thinking first to figure out exactly what is involved with making that change and how much do we think that's going to cost so we can make a good business decision as to whether to make that change at all and if so, when to build it into the product. As time goes on, people are going to be implementing requirements and then verifying whatever they built. And we want to track the status of each requirement so that we know when we're done. Uh, it's often valuable to make sure that we didn't omit something accidentally. I've had that experience, get to the end of a project and just suddenly realized I forgot to implement one of the requirements. I just missed it. And so we want to trace requirements into all of the work products we create because that requirement existed, designs, code, tests, possibly other things. And I'll say a little bit about the possibility of storing requirements in a requirements management tool as opposed to in some more traditional form. Now, a few points I'd like to make here. So note that when I talk about requirements, you should mentally substitute for that word whatever form you use to record requirements on your project. It could be a list of functional requirements. Uh, you could be using acceptance tests to get your requirements details recorded. You might be using user stories or something else. It doesn't matter. Whatever form you use, you need to manage that information effectively if you want your project to be successful. Now, each set of requirements that you create could represent 100% of the final product in a pure waterfall development approach, or it could represent just a small fraction of the ultimate product, like in a single agile sprint. But you're going to have some sets of requirements that you're going to be implementing in chunks. Now, another point I want to make is that the extent to which you need to perform these activities varies from project to project. I suggest you think about the amount of effort that would be involved with performing these, which is usually not huge, not as much as people maybe are afraid of, and then balance that against the risk of not performing these activities as you go through the thought process to decide which of these things should uh, help your project be successful. So let's take a look at each of these practices in turn. A baseline represents a snapshot in time. It's a work product or a set of work products that serve as the starting point for making changes. And that serves as a foundation for all the subsequent activities you perform. So here's a formal definition of a baseline, whether it's a requirements baseline or a code baseline or any other starting point for work that we do. So a baseline is a reviewed, approved by the right people and agreed upon set of requirements that are committed to be implemented in a specific product release or development iteration. So for example, when a product owner on an agile project allocate certain stories to an iteration, they're defining a baseline of what they plan to deliver in that iteration. So as we go through um, uh, a project, many projects have some sort of a sign-off um, procedure. You know, that may not be something that you do on your project, but it's certainly true for many projects. And uh, you have some sort of approval. Someone has to make a decision that, yes, this is what we're going to build. Let's go do that. And you know, there's a question that always comes up is what does sign off mean? Uh, a lot of times people have some sign off ritual they go through. Um, maybe it means that some manager was given a form, a piece of paper that has his name on it and a line above the name, and he has to sign on that line or nobody writes any code. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that manager read the document, understood it, or agrees to it. They just went through the ritual. But I think we should all agree in our organizations what we mean by sign off. And here's what I propose sign off means. It should mean a statement like, I agree that this body of, of requirements serves as a foundation for the next stage of the work to begin. I agree to make changes following our established change control process. And here comes the part nobody likes. I agree that changes in these requirements might require that we renegotiate commitments. Nobody likes that part. They want change to be free, but change is never free. Even the process of discussing a possible change and then saying, no, let's not do that. That costs you some time. So change is never free. But I think it's important for each organization that has some kind of sign-off process to agree on exactly what we mean 
when we're going through that step. Some people actually write that kind of language right into their sign off form if that's what they use. So when a baseline is defined, several things start. That's the point at which formal change control begins. Before we agree on a baseline, we know that we're still trying to figure out what it is we're going to build. There's some negotiation, there's some discovery and so forth. But when we define a baseline, that's when we have to start getting serious. I mean, if you have a, a, an iteration defined and something else comes along that absolutely has to be in that iteration, you better go through some careful thought to figure out how are we going to accommodate that. At that point, also, when a baseline is defined, managers are typically making commitments, schedule commitments or scope commitments. And managers need to determine what resources, staff and budget and so forth, they're going to need to meet their schedule commitments. So that's when we start getting serious about software development. It's when we define a baseline. So it's worth uh, thinking about how you do that on your projects. So let's move, turn to the next practice, which is version management. Now, maybe you've been in a meeting. I've, I've certainly seen this kind of uh, meeting take place where somebody said something like, oh, the customer canceled requirement 27. And you said, well, wait a minute. Requirement 27 is still at the top of page five. What version of the specification do you have? And the other person says, well, I have version 3.1. What do you have? Well, I have 3.1 also, but my 3.1 is different from your 3.1. I don't know if you've ever encountered that situation, but it's not uncommon. And at that point, you just don't know what to believe. And so people have to be careful to make sure that we're all working from a shared understanding of the set of requirements. Uh, problems come up when team members are unknowingly working from different versions of the requirements. Again, not necessarily documents, but whatever form of the requirements you're representing things in. So we need to place our requirements documents under some kind of version control. And as changes happen, we need to keep our requirements documentation up to date so that everyone has access to the current version. Every one of you on your project should be able to go back to work. And if someone says, what are the requirements for this next piece that we're working on? All of you should have the same answer. You should all have access to that same block of information. And there should be no ambiguity or confusion about that. And one way we can help make this easier is to make sure that only certain people can update that set of requirements, okay? Because if anybody can go in and change them at any time, there will definitely be some communication problems. So there are several ways we can do that. The best approach is to store the requirements in some kind of a database. So there's only one copy of the requirements. And uh, a good way to do this is with a, a commercial requirements management tool. And that way everybody knows that that's the ultimate repository for the requirements information. And if you need some of that, you can generate a report or do a query in the database. If you don't happen to have one of those kinds of products available, the next best approach is to store any documents you are using in a configuration management system. And I would argue that a bunch of sticky notes on a whiteboard isn't a very good configuration management system. Okay, it's too easy to have things uh, go wrong. You can even have a sticky note fall off the board and fall on the floor and nobody notices it for a while. That's not a very robust system. But here's a technique I've actually used when we are storing information in documents is to have some kind of a version identification scheme, a manual process. And people have all sorts of mechanisms they use, you know, X dot Y versions and so forth. And, and that can get confusing. But I've used this, a simple scheme I'm going to show you here even for things that have nothing to do with requirements. Like um, I've written many books and sometimes I've worked with some other people on the books and, uh, or I've written processes for some of my consulting clients. And as we go back and forth, we need to be able to keep straight what versions we're on. So I've used a scheme like this just to label different kinds of documents. So the first version of anything we create is called version 1.0 draft one. We want to distinguish draft versions from approved or baseline versions. The next iteration would be version 1.0 draft two, and you can go through as many drafts as you need to this way. But ultimately, you're going to come up with something that we have some uh, agreement on, and now we can call that an approved version of 1.0. But then life happens and change happens, and so we might need to make a new version, which we could call, if it's a small change, 1.1 draft one. If it's a big change, we might call it 2.0 draft one. So this is a manual scheme, just a, a convention that you can follow to distinguish 
uh, a series of versions of the same deliverable as it iterates and goes through its life cycle. But the best approach is to store the requirements in some kind of a, of a requirements management tool. So change control is really the heart of requirements management. And the reason we have to be serious about this is because uncontrolled changes can cause lots of problems. Uh, if people make changes that perhaps other people don't know about or weren't approved or expected, that can lead to rework as we have to modify products that uh, were affected by that. Um, depending on how you incorporate changes into the product, that can affect the quality of the product. I like to introduce changes at the highest level of abstraction that they affect. So if we're changing user visible functionality, I like to change my description of the requirements, move that down into the design elements and architectural elements so that we understand what impact that requirement has there, and down into code and so forth. Now, if you just change the code directly, then you can start ending up with brittle code. You can end up with uh, accumulating technical debt that you're going to have to correct later on um, because all of a sudden you're departing from your intended design and then the design becomes more and more brittle, harder and harder to change in the future. So introduce changes at the highest level of abstraction that that change affects. If you're modifying code to maybe improve performance or something, but no, not changing the user visible uh, behavior, there's no need to change the requirements, just change the code. Otherwise, let's start at the top. And if we have changes that are going on in ways people don't necessarily expect, it's going to be hard to predict when we're going to finish some body of work. So I think we should define a change process for how we're going to handle requirements, just like we have a change process for how we handle anything else on a project. And this process doesn't have to be complicated, but it should have certain pieces of information in it. It should describe how uh, people propose requirements, how they're reviewed and evaluated, who approves them, and how we incorporate those changes in the rest of the project. We should define some little life cycle for the change statuses that we could have. And I'll show you one of those in just a moment here. Uh, impact analysis should be an important part of this so that we find that we can really understand what we're doing and make sensible decisions rather than uninformed decisions. It's a great idea to support a tool or support the process with a tool, but remember, a tool is not a process. It is not a substitute for a process. I was at a client site once teaching a class and, and uh, I asked them, um, you know, do you have a change control process in place for requirements? And someone said, yes, we use Tracker. Tracker was a commercial tool for managing problem reports and change requests. I said, well, does everybody know how to use Tracker? Do they know what steps you go through and when someone submits something into Tracker and, and how it gets then folded into the product? We use Tracker, they said. They had a tool. They did not have a process. And the two need to go together. So there's all kinds of uh, problem tracking and defect reporting systems that you can use for this sort of thing. And I have a philosophy that all change requests must follow the process. When I worked at Kodak, I'd be walking down the hall and somebody might say, hey, I've, I've got an idea for a change I'd like to make in that system you're working on. And so I would say, okay, um, that sounds reasonable. Could you put it into our, our uh, change tool that we use? And, you know, a funny thing happened about half the time, those requests never showed up. And I'm thinking, it doesn't take you very much work to do this. This is very simple. You've used it before. Um, and my feeling is if this change that you have in mind isn't important enough to you to take one minute to put it through our process so we can compare it against all the other work we have to do, then I don't care at all. And I wouldn't even give it another thought. Now, I might say, sure, I'll put it in when I get back to my office. That's fine. I don't care how it gets into the tool, into the process, but it has to go through the process. And I'll say it again. Sometimes if you make a change in requirements, you may need to renegotiate your project commitments. Something else might have to wait or not get done at all, or we might have to uh, take a little more time to finish something. So I don't think you should do any work on a change that's proposed until it goes through this process of being approved and recorded somewhere and communicated to all the other people who need to know about it. So you can define a set of possible statuses that a change request might go through at any given time. And you can define a set of allowed changes and conditions that, that lead to a change from one status to another. This describes the life cycle of a change request. And a state transition diagram or state chart diagram 
uh, like the one shown here, is an excellent way to represent this set of possible statuses, just like it's useful in, you know, a state transition diagram is useful for any object in a software system that can go through multiple statuses. So the change request starts out with a status of submitted. This is just a proposed way to, to handle this. Um, then it goes through some sort of evaluation process. Someone might do a technical evaluation or assess how much it would cost to do this. And then it's got a status of evaluated. Then someone makes a decision. They might approve it to be incorporated into the product and allocate it to a particular iteration or a release. At some point, you're going to do some work on that and you're going to make the change. And then we might change the status to change made. And then someone can verify that the change was made correctly and in all the affected work products. And if that happens, then we can close out the change request as being completely processed. But there are some other possible routes here. Maybe when you make the change, the person attempts to verify it and they discover, hmm, that wasn't done correctly. Maybe the change wasn't implemented as requested or it broke something else. And so the status has to go back to approve because we have to do some more work on it. So that's one possible uh, route. Another possibility is to streamline things. You might skip this formal verified cha change state uh, if it's simple enough and uh, low enough risk and you might go directly from change made to closed you know that's your choice but you should define the conditions and the scope of the change that would follow one of these paths or the other okay um, but you know maybe when someone evaluated the change request they didn't approve it after all they rejected it for one of many possible reasons so rejected would be one of the terminal states that uh, we could have or at some point while you're working on it, for whatever reason, it might get canceled and we decide not to do it after all. So these three states of rejected, canceled, and closed are the possible terminal states that say we are now completely done processing that change request. So I think you'll find it illuminating to kind of track the distribution of change requests over time. This will show you how much change activity is taking place. And when I've done this uh, on one of uh, our, in one of the projects or groups I worked in, we found it uh, useful to see how quickly were we able to process change requests. That was also good information. Now, one trap to watch out for here is don't define too many statuses. I once saw, was at a client site and saw a person configuring their new change control tool, and they set up 20 change statuses like this. And even if those are all logically reasonable, no one's going to use 20 statuses. If you make the process and tool that complex, that can just discourage people from using it at all because they think, well, this isn't worth the trouble. And so then they'll try to do things through the back door instead of following the process. So like any other process, it has to be practical and it has to get the job done. So this figure shows how a typical change control system works. We used a system like this. In fact, I built it at Kodak to let people submit bug reports, enhancement requests, uh, requests for requirements, changes in, in new systems, and even just ask for help. So you have some kind of a, a tool uh, that interfaces to a database to store the information, and the user could submit uh, some kind of a defect report or, or a enhancement request into the tool using the interface. And when that happens, uh, emails with that information got sent both back to them so they knew what the tracking number was and that it had been received. And those emails got sent off to people who were involved with the project. Uh, we have a role we call the product champion. A product champion is a key user representative who's one of the most important participants in deciding whether we're going to uh, accept a change request and incorporate it or not. And then we have the support staff and, and uh, might be a product owner and other decision makers who are going to be involved with uh, assessing the request and, and maybe even implementing it. And those people can talk offline outside this, this tool process and they can respond to each of the requests that came in to update the contents in the, in the database. They can change the status using that little life cycle I just showed you as we work on the change. And then those updates get emailed back to the user who requested it, and that way the user knows what's going on. So I think this automatic email communication with the various stakeholders makes this a useful two-way communication tool and uh, helps make sure everybody is aware of, of uh, how we're going on processing the change. It's frustrating for people to put in a change request and just have it disappear into a black hole. They don't know what happened. So we also wanna be able to generate reports coming out of the database contents here so we know how we're handling things. 
Now, someone has to make decisions regarding which proposed changes to incorporate into the product. And the official term for that group of people is the Change Control Board, also called the Configuration Control Board, or CCB. Now, when you use a term like board, that you know, comes up with an image of time-wasting bureaucratic process overhead, but it doesn't have to be that way. It should be no larger or more formal than it needs to be to make sure that the right people make informed business decisions about which change requests to approve. Um, sometimes you might have one person like a product owner who's fully empowered to do that on certain projects, but larger and more complex projects usually have a CCB that's got people representing different uh, interest areas here. Um, and you might even have multiple levels of CCB on a big project that has, each CCB has a certain scope of decision-making authority, depending on how broad the impact of the change is. Now this, this group of people has to be authorized to make binding decisions. If they can only make suggestions and someone else makes the decision, then that other person is really serving as the change control board. If you're going to have a board like this, it's a good idea for them to agree on how they're going to function. So you might want to adopt a CCB charter. Uh, and that charter would describe the purpose of this particular CCB, its scope of authority, uh, who's involved, how they meet, how they make decisions, and how they communicate those decisions. Now, you can get example documents of many of the things I'm talking about here, incidentally, a CCB charter, um, a uh, impact analysis worksheet. You can get samples of those um, to start with from my website, processimpact.com. If you go to processimpact.com, there's a uh, button that says uh, goodies, and there's a bunch of things there, are useful downloads. Now, I should warn you, the downloads aren't free. They cost a few dollars, but the money is all donated to a consultant who has been uh, disabled with a brain injury from a car accident for more than 20 years. So this helps him out a little bit and helps you out too. So typically the change control board will, will consider change requests periodically. They might ask some technical people to go do impact analysis. They make these decisions to accept or reject the, the uh, change requests and communicate those to everybody. And they might allocate the uh, uh, change to a particular release or iteration or set priorities. So uh, the Change Control Board is really just the uh, group of people that make decisions about what changes we're going to do. And I think that everybody has somebody on the project who's serving in this function, even if they're not using that term. So it doesn't hurt to formalize that so we all understand how the changes are handled. I should say a little bit about how to manage change on Agile projects. I'm sure many of you are working on, on Agile projects. And they typically work by uh, managing change by main, maintaining a dynamic backlog of the work that remains to be done. So if we're thinking about the current iteration that we're working on. We are looking ahead to the next iteration. And then we have all the future iterations that have uh, work waiting in the, in the wings here. So by work, we're talking about user stories that are yet to be implemented, defects to be corrected, technical debt to be reduced, and all the many other activities that are involved with any project. So the idea here, of course, is that each iteration implements the set of work items in the backlog that have the highest priority at that time. So as stakeholders request new work, it goes into the backlog and is prioritized against the other backlog contents. Work that's not yet been done could be maybe deleted from time to time, removed from the backlog, or it might be reprioritized so that we, if we have something that comes in, we say we have to do this in the next iteration, but we've already thought about what's going into that iteration, we might have to push something back into the backlog for future work so we have enough capacity to get the, the uh, work done in that uh, time boxed iteration. Um, so carefully managing the scope of each iteration Make sure that we're completing it on time and with high quality instead of just trying to cram more and more into a fixed size box. Maybe you've had an experience like this. You're walking down the hall at work and someone stops you with a request to make a change in the system you're working on. You know, the request seems sensible, so you say, sure, no problem. So you go back to your office, your business analyst maybe, and you start thinking about the problem. And the more that you peel away the layers of this problem, the bigger the problem gets. And you realize, hmm, this is the exact opposite of what someone else requested a few days ago. And maybe it's going to take a lot more work than you initially thought it was going to take. And you said, sure, no problem. 
but then maybe it is a problem. So before we make that commitment to someone, let's make sure we've thought about and really understand the request. So there's a thought process you can go through for impact analysis. And I have some checklists with this on that uh, goodies page that I mentioned at processimpact.com. And here are some of the kinds of things you want to think about before you say, sure, no problem. See if this request is going to conflict with any other existing requirements that are either already implemented or waiting to be implemented. You want to identify the affected design, code, and test components. You know, how much work are we going to have to do if we're going to um, incorporate this change? Is it going to have some impact on our user interface or database or reports or any of the other components beyond just pure code? Uh, could there be some other systems or shared libraries or anything that this change would affect? Um, what are we going to have to review any of the work products that we've created? Um, are we going to have to update any of our plans or documents? So it turns out that handling even a simple change often requires more work than we think it does just from looking at it and a, and a quick consideration. So using a checklist like this can help you do a more thorough analysis job in just a little bit of time so you really know what you're getting into. Now, with as with all generic checklists that people offer you like this, it's a good idea to tailor them and customize them to best meet the needs of your particular project, but they provide a good starting point. A few more questions we might want to think about here for the impact analysis. Is the change even technically feasible? Sometimes people ask for things that for one reason or another, we just can't do. Will it affect performance or other quality attributes? You don't want to degrade any of the other quality characteristics unless there's a very good reason. Would it overload technical resources? I have talked to people who worked on projects uh, for example, that ran daily, but took more than 24 hours to actually run. Well, you can't run them daily if it takes more than 24 hours to complete the run. Uh, so it's just got too much functionality um, crammed into it at that point. <clears throat> well, you have to throw out anything else that you've already done. We want to try to avoid that. Sometimes people ask for <clears throat> changes or, or requirements that would violate business rules, and uh, that's a pretty bad idea. And the outcome, <clears throat> excuse me, the outcome for all of this is that you want to have an idea of how much work are we talking about if we're going to implement this change. So the next practice, practice I want to talk about is uh, status tracking with the help of requirements. You know, a lot of times our project status tracking is kind of vague. Uh, the project manager might ask, hey, Carl, how are you coming on that subsystem? And I say, pretty good. I'm about 90% done. And she says, well, weren't you 90% done a couple of weeks ago? And I say, yes, but now I'm really 90% done. Okay. We have this kind of joke in software that uh, all projects are always about 90% done. Um, but we can do better than that. So we need to be able to track the status of our project more realistically and accurately. You know, agile projects often use a burn down chart to track status of uh, work completed. But another way to track it is to see what percent of the requirements that were allocated to the product baseline have various statuses. And we can uh, have numerous statuses here that we're going to use to uh, describe uh, what position in the life cycle our requirement request is. Um, every requirement starts out as being proposed, which simply means that it was requested by some legitimate source that can provide input on requirements. Maybe it's approved, which means it's been analyzed and we understand the impact and it's allocated to a particular baseline. Uh, at some point, someone's going to write and test some code so that requirement's been implemented and then hopefully verified to show that it was implemented correctly. But maybe we deleted it from the baseline. We decided not to implement it after all for some reason. Or maybe we approved it, but then we said, no, we're not going to do it now. Let's defer it to some later state. Uh, or perhaps it never made it through the first gate and it was rejected in the first place, um, requested but not approved. Actually, it's a good idea to remember those because they come back to life sometimes and we might uh, end up approving it later on. So if you have a series of statuses like this assigned for requirements, then you can monitor them as they go through their life cycle. And we can maybe even track their status over time with a chart like this. This shows visually how the distribution of requirements in some baseline changes over time. You see, we start out with them all being uh, proposed in the red line here, 
And then over time, the green line will show which ones have been completed, that is implemented and verified. And the blue line at the bottom shows which ones have been deleted. So by the end of the project, um, all of the requirements should either be verified or deleted. And that's how you know that you're done. Okay, so this is a visual way to track your requirements status and hence your project status for a piece of work. So another technique that I want to talk about is the idea of requirements traceability, also called tracing. And this is especially necessary on products that have to go through some certification process where you have to build, prove that you built in all the capabilities that you said you were going to build. So we might want to trace each of our functional requirements back to where it came from, some system requirement or a use case or a user story or a business rule, and then trace it downward into the design components that we created, the code that was written, the tests that were written to go along and verify that requirement and so forth. So to do requirements traceability, which is basically connecting threads to tie these pieces together, the main requirement is that every requirement has to have a unique identifier. And this is true whether they're in a document, a database, or on story cards. You need to have a unique identifier. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to all of them. I kind of like the last one here, uh, a hierarchical naming scheme, print.confirm copies, okay? That would be an example of how you label a requirement in a way that's somewhat meaningful and people can get an idea of, of what it means and, and where it fits in with other related properties because of a hierarchy with the, the dots. Uh, I could look at a requirement called 3.1.4.2, but I have no idea what that requirement's about. That tells me nothing, it's just a random label. So let's give requirements meaningful labels uh, that are unique and persistent and don't change over time. And then we can build a requirements traceability matrix. This is a way to organize these connections between requirements and other system elements. So the requirements traceability matrix constitutes a roadmap for the components of the system. Uh, and there are various ways you can do this. Uh, sometimes for simple projects, uh, small ones, I've used a little table like this where I have a column where I list each of the requirements. And then as I do work on the project, I can fill in the columns to show where was that requirement addressed in the design, what uh, source code addressed it, test cases, and so forth. So don't view this as nuisance documentation that you create at the end of the project if you have time. You have to do it as you go along and then fill in this information. It's very hard to reconstruct it after you're done, but as you're going along, then it becomes a working tool. So there are a lot of benefits to this. You don't overlook requirements during design and implementation accidentally because this, uh, this set of uh, matrices will let you know exactly what work you have and have not yet done. So you can use it to see at a glance what work has been completed. And it's also helpful because suppose one of these tests fail. Suppose test action.3 broke. You have to figure out where the problem is and you can use that test to link back to the requirement that it was verifying, and then you can follow the threads down to see where in the code you might look for the problem. Suppose someone comes along and says, we wanna change requirement FR117. Well, you can look at this to see if we've already done work on it. And if we have, this will tell you what parts of the system you might have to modify to accommodate that test. So you're not gonna do this on every project, but it's not a lot of work if you do it as you go along and it can add a fair amount of value. So think about whether this would be useful on your project or not. So requirements documents are the traditional way to store this information, but they have a number of limitations that make them clumsy to work with as things evolve over the course of the project. And here are some of those problems. It's uh, difficult to handle requirements when you're planning multiple releases or iterations. It's not easy to move a requirement from one baseline to another. You know, when you're only gonna be doing a subset of the requirements in your document uh, in a particular release. It's hard to reuse requirements information that's stored in documents. And it can be uh, hard to connect information in multiple locations from, you know, a vision and scope document to a use case to, uh, uh, software requirements spec and so forth. And sometimes it's hard to make sure that everybody has access to the current version without any confusion. So this is where requirements management tools become helpful. Um, I imagine some of you are already using these. There are dozens of requirements management tools available on the market with a lot of capabilities and a wide range of costs as well. 
So here are some of the kinds of things these tools can do for you. Uh, they'll help you greatly with managing versions and changes. Some of them will maintain a version history of every single requirement in there. And then you can define a baseline by just allocating certain requirements to uh, a particular release. You can store information beyond the statement of the requirement to have additional requirements attributes. Um, and then you can generate a report by doing a query to filter the set of requirements with certain attributes. So that way you can create a requirement specification document if you need one. As a report from the database that says, show me all of the requirements that were assigned to Carl that have a uh, priority of high and uh, a status of uh, incomplete. Okay, so you can pull out just the set of requirements you need to focus on. These are the only practical way to handle traceability links for any complex large project to show these connections to other requirements, designs, and tests, and so forth. And those traceability links can help you with the impact analysis, as we just saw. Finally, they will control access so you can set group and individual permissions so that only certain people can, uh, can access the uh, requirements to make changes and communicate those to everybody uh, using a, a web interface. So simply buying a requirements management tool doesn't solve your problems. And it's very important to remember that a requirements management tool is not a requirements development tool. They aren't going to help you write good requirements, so you need to do that first. You already need to know how to find and get and write good requirements, because if you put crappy requirements into the tool, you're going to get crappy requirements back out. They don't make them better. So don't expect the tool to replace the process, okay? It automates and accelerates and provides structure to, the, to your process, but it doesn't replace it. You should expect some culture change if you're moving from handling requirements in some manual way to into a tool. People are going to have to change the way they, they think about their body of requirements and how they interact with others. Sometimes people get carried away. You can define user-defined attributes for each of these requirement types, but sometimes people create too many requirement types or too many attributes. And then again, you've made it more complicated than people are going to use, and it's, uh, it's over, overly heavy and not useful. These tools can be fairly complicated, so expect to have to train the tool users, and people have to know what the responsibilities are with respect to the tool. Uh, I've seen companies that had a requirements management tool, but they also stored their requirements in documents. And the document was the actual repository. So when they made a change, they had to update the document and update the tool. Um, you have to change how you think about requirements if you're going to go with this tool. And you have to know who's got what kinds of authority and responsibilities for the information in it. And take good advantage of tool features. Uh, I know of one company that used it use their expensive RM tool only to generate massive traceability reports, which were important for this huge project, but then they found that nobody used the traceability reports. So they didn't get much benefit from the rest of the tool. So I know I've kind of gone quickly here through uh, a lot of different practices. It's up to you to decide which of these practices would be valuable for your project. I think you will find that most of them will be useful on most projects. And the reason that we emphasize uh, requirements and managing them well is to avoid the surprise factor that happens at the end of so many software projects. My experience has been that surprises at the end of a software project are usually not good news. It usually means something went wrong, somebody's unhappy. So I hope you got some useful ideas here. Um, this uh, information, you can find a lot more about this in my book with Joy Beatty, Software Requirements. Um, a couple of other books I've written recently you might find interesting, Successful Business Analysis Consulting. And my latest book came out just a few months ago called The Thoughtless Design of Everyday Things, where uh, we've all had the experience of uh, using products and saying, did the designer of this product ever use a product like this before? I don't think so. And that's what that book's all about, is how we can do a much better job of uh, designing products. So thank you very much, and I think we have time for a few questions. Thank you so much, Carl. It was an amazing presentation. Actually, uh, you know, we've had quite an extensive communication in the chat because so many people who is reviewing, you know, your talk recognized you. And I couldn't resist because I think I just have to read you one of the comments that was left by one of our audience members. 
Uh, the comment is by Olga Margelova, and she says, Carl Wiggers is a legend. It's really hard to find a BA who didn't read his book. I'm thrilled to be here and listen to his real life talk. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation and being here. And uh, I have to mention also that a lot of the people have, you know, plussed to that. So agreed with this mm -hmm. statement. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And That's very kind. <laughs> Awesome. And we actually have quite a lot of questions, so uh, I would suggest to jump right into them. First of them is uh, we start by most popular ones, okay? So the first one is from Marta Taranko. If you could give one single advice to all BAs, both novice and experienced, that would help them to be a better professional, what would it be? One piece of advice, I would say find real users and work with them and focus the requirements on usage, not on product features. I awesome. think that's the most important advice. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next one is by Roman Koshovsky. In the modern agile world, BAs sometimes are getting closer to product owner roles. So we go away from requirements engineering. <laughs> towards understanding the business needs and driving more complex initiatives. Any suggestions on how can we improve and remain valuable for teams and businesses in this changing world? Well, I would argue that that is exactly what requirements engineering is. The whole point of requirements engineering is to try to arrive at a, a shared understanding of first, the business problem, the customer needs, and then second, to describe a solution, both in terms of its functionality and its characteristics, like non-functional properties, that will address that need and meet our business objectives. To me, that's what requirements engineering is. So I would argue that that's exactly what a product owner or a BA on an Agile project is supposed to be doing. Awesome. Thank you so much for your answer. So the next question is from Sergei Nalivaiko. Can you say that your software requirements book, sorry, uh, <laughs> more questions are coming up and that's why it's a little <laughs> jumpy. Okay, so can you say that your software requirements book published more than 20 years ago is still up to date and a smiley face from Sergey? Well, I would point out that yes, the first edition of the requirements book was published in 1999. The second edition was published in 2003. The third edition, which you see on the screen here was published in 2013. So it's not 20 years old. Uh, and we have made a lot of updates. In fact, this, this edition uh, can, is the same size as the first two editions put together. We added many chapters on, uh, for example, agile projects, on various specific kinds of projects, big data projects, uh, outsource projects, a lot of the kinds of things that weren't addressed in the earlier edition. And one of the interesting things about uh, uh, requirements is that compared to most areas of software engineering, Requirements don't change very much. Requirements is not a technical problem so much as a human communication problem. And so the need to find the right user representatives, to understand the business problems, to, uh, to interact with people to understand what kind of solution will meet those needs, and the techniques you use to work with people to gain that information, to represent the information in various ways to communicate it, I don't think that changes very fast. So I think a lot of that information is still uh, pertinent. It doesn't depend on the languages you're using. It doesn't depend on the life cycle you're following. What will change is how you slice and dice those practices, you know, how much depth you go into, when you do them, how you represent the information. But, you know, the user doesn't care how you build software. The user has needs. They want solutions that meet those needs that they can enjoy using and use effectively. I don't see why that changes very much over time. Awesome, thank you very much. So the next question actually is now the most popular one. <laughs> so Yevgenia Popova asks, it looks like everyone wants to perform the product management activities, not the BA. Do you think BA profession in IT has a future? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the way it's grown over the last, say 10 or 15 years to be recognized as a discipline, um, I think the Agile business has actually done a disservice by downplaying the role of the BA because what they've done in some projects is they've diluted that. And now you expect every developer to be able to function as a BA. 
that was what we tried to do 40 or 50 years ago before so we had true. these specializations. <laughs> and, you know, this is a, this is a hard business software. Uh, it's not reasonable to expect everybody to be expert in anything in, in all of these areas. I'm sure, you know, people on your project teams that don't want to deal with customers and don't want to talk about requirements and do BA work. And you probably don't want them to either. <laughs> They're probably very good technically, but maybe not so good on the communication part. In fact, I have a new book coming out in the fall called Software Development Pearls, Lessons from 50 Years of Software Experience, where I talk about some of these kinds of uh, tech practices and issues, lessons I've learned over my career and, and life. Uh, and you know, a lot of those are, are timeless. And I think uh, the Agile movement by just sort of expecting that all developers know how to talk with users about requirements is, is not a, a helpful approach. Um, uh, having a product owner perform BA role, I think, helps, but maybe they don't want to call themselves BA, but that's the job they're doing whenever you're working with customers to understand requirements, whenever you're dealing with changes, whenever you're trying to make sure that, that we've described a solution that's going to meet needs, you're working as a BA by any title. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. So the next question is from Yulia Timoshenko. What what should go first, requirements or UX wireframes? There are a lot of projects with UX first, requirements after process. Is it possible to have a health process product in such environment? No, because awesome. <laughs> I mean, how, how do you know what to build in your wireframe? Exactly. Okay. I mean, you have to have some information that says, if you know, here, here's a way we might approach a, a solution, a UX a solution. So if the UX, if you do the wireframes first, then you're saying, here's the answer. And then I wonder, well, what was the question? Okay. So the question has to drive the answer. Now, this is an iterative process and you can use them back and forth. So you don't start out with a complete set of requirements or even a clear set of part of the requirements. You start out with ideas and needs and generating wireframes or other forms of steps toward a solution are good ways to iterate and try to understand requirements better and, uh, and begin to come to a, a clearer, richer understanding. But if you start with a wireframe, I still think that there's something behind that that says, let's, let's come up with a solution. And that something is requirements, at least a very preliminary version of them. Awesome. Thank you very much. We still have a few minutes, so we'll take a few more answers and then, uh, sorry, questions, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so the next question is from Dennis Petrov. Carl, how do you see requirements management process in Agile? Well, as I kind of suggested here, the things you have to do on an Agile project are the same as on any other project. You need to deal with change, you need to deal with tracking status, you need to make sure everyone has a has access to uh, to shared understanding of what requirements we're implementing, whatever you call them, stories or whatever, uh, what we're implementing in a particular iteration. Um, but you scale it back, okay? Uh, so you still have to uh, do some impact analysis before you commit to a change, for example. So you're not really doing anything different. You're maybe doing them as a smaller scale many times, okay? but the ideas are the same. Now, when it comes to things like requirements traceability, I still think it's a good idea to take a, a starting point, even if it's a story and say, did we build this? Where did that show up in some design? Where did that show up in some code? What test did we do for that? Now, the test part is easy. If people are using something like Gherkin, you know, where they're just intrinsically building acceptance tests linked back to a story, then that helps with that kind of traceability. But I think the practices, the principles are the same, but the uh, the scale at which you implement them and when you implement them is just sliced up in smaller bits. But I think awesome. the need for the for monitoring and managing requirements doesn't change. Awesome. Thank you very much. And the last question is from Konstantin uh, Lukyanenko. Could you play your favorite tune live on your guitar? If you don't mind, <laughs> I will answer this question. Guys, we, we ran officially out of time. So I will share the link for uh, Carl's website where you can check out all the tunes. But Carl, maybe you can suggest one of your most favorite tunes ever on your website for our team. To well, I have about 40, 45 songs on the website. 18 of them are originals that I wrote. The rest are covers and some of them are better than others because I've gotten better at this as I've, as I've uh, learned more about recording. 
Um, but it kind of depends on on uh, who you like. I mean, I'm pretty old, so I like a lot of old rock and roll. Uh, there's a bunch of Beatles songs there. There's some songs by the Eagles. Um, some of the original songs are, are kind of fun. Um, I think my latest song is one that I like a lot. It's an instrumental, so you don't have to listen to me sing. I'm not a good singer. I, I don't let that stop me, but I'm not awesome. a good singer. But uh, one that I like a lot is my latest instrumental. It's called Wednesday's Child. Awesome. So maybe, you'll, maybe you'll like that one. Thank you very much, Carl. Thanks a lot for the amazing presentation and also for your pa patience with our questions. Again, you mm. are a big star in our organization <laughs> among the VAs. So we really appreciate the time that you have spent sharing with us your uh, super valuable expertise. So thanks a lot. Thank you to everybody for, uh, for uh, participating in um, this session and asking the questions. And we will see you in the next section. So see you later and bye. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Lilia. Bye.